God bless you. And welcome to another episode of Quarantined with Lavelle. I am excited to be here today. We have a uh, subject that we're going to be dealing with today, and I have some very distinguished guests, some mighty men of God who are going to help us out today. Amen. But first, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to have your way through this program. Lord, we ask you to speak uh, biblically and prophetically through these mighty men of God today. Help us to be open to hear what the Spirit is saying through them, that we know how to live our lives in accordance with your word and to go forth as men and women of God in this nation, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have your way right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, listen, I need you right now to click that share button. I want this program to go out and I want as many people as possible to make sure that they are seeing this program, hearing what's being said and digesting what the Lord is going to say through each of these mighty men of God. So I truly thank God for them. I'm going on here right now and I'm going to share it as well. Amen. So make sure you share or even uh, if you so choose, start a watch party. <laughs> start a watch party. That always helps our viewership and helps more people get on. So I just shared it myself. Um, and if you can share it or start a watch party, that would be awesome as well. I am not going to go through my opening monologue because I want to give these men of God as much time as possible on the show today. So I'm going to bring them right on into the studio. Uh, my first guest is the pastor, the, the, the overseer of Shiloh Deliverance Church International, who is now pastored by his son, Pastor Chioki Bracey. But he and his wife are the overseers of not only that church, but many other churches in the city, in the nation, and even in the world. So I thank God for one of the spiritual fathers, Apostle Bobby Bracey. God bless you, Apostle. Welcome to the show. Yes, yes, sir. Amen. Thank God for you. Amen. My next guest is the senior pastor of Fountain of Truth. See the Fountain is the website, seethefountain.com, and you can check them out. They are uh, presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ like never before, as well as reaching out to their community and not only is he a mighty man of God, a mighty pastor, a mighty father uh, of uh, naturally and spiritually, but he's also my cousin. So I truly, truly thank God for this mighty man of God being here with us today, Bishop Michael Jones Sr. God bless you, Bishop. Bless you, bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to thank see you, Pastor. God bless you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And my my third guest, who uh, is definitely not least, he is not only a judge at the 36th District Court for over 20 years, but uh, he is also a pastor and he's the pastor of New Breakthrough International. Amen. He's also the overseer of many other churches as well. So we truly thank God for Apostle Donald Coleman being in with us today. God bless you, Apostle. Well, God bless you to everyone. Good to good to be with you, uh, Minister Lavelle. Good to be with you, uh, with you, Bishop Jones, Apostle uh, Bracey. Bless you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be sharing this uh, this time and this space with each of you. Amen. Amen. You know, as I was considering the the tragedies that have been going on in our country since the coronavirus hit, and and even be way before. Um, I was praying and I was like, I really want to do a show on race, race in America and race in the church. And I could not think of anyone better than you three to talk about it because you all are balanced and you all know how to uh, hear from God uh, prophetically as well as well versed biblically. And I truly felt like you all could give us some wonderful, wonderful advice. So we we just thank God <laughs> for all of you all being here today. Amen. All right, let thank me pull you. my notes thank out. You, Mr. Lavelle. 
All right. Amen. I wrote a little note here. I said race in America is at a critical point now. So we're going to talk about how we as black men and black women can carry uh, ourselves. And the first example that I thought about, uh, Bishop Jones was uh, doing a teaching and he mentioned a situation that happened to him while he was at his at his son's house. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and give it over to him just for a second to talk about this uh, situation that happened with a, uh, a fireman who at that point, uh, in a natural sense, was was in authority and how he handled that. And I just want you all to hear the the wisdom that went forth, because, Bishop, a lot of times we, you know, we, we, we we're carrying a chip on our shoulder. We want to attack. We want to fight. You know, we, we just want to want to want to, you know, do what we do. And you you held yourself. But I'm going to let you go ahead and and give that back <laughs> and then we'll talk about it. Well, certainly, certainly. Uh, let me just say uh, thank you for allowing us to be a part of your show. Uh, the situation you're talking about is like uh, I was by my son's house and uh, on my way leaving, heading home, there was a car that ran off into the ditch and crashed, I guess, and they, the fire trucks came and all that and they was trying to get the guy where they had showed up and everything was sitting still. And uh, so everybody was kind of on pause. So I went to approach to pass by. Just as I did, uh, the fireman stepped out of the truck and uh, it shocked him that I was moving by. And so he got a little authoritative, if you will, and started screaming and hollering, you know, and telling me to slow down. I was actually creeping, but <laughs> I, uh, I paused and I didn't respond to him. And so basically, uh, had I responded in my own true nature, <laughs> it would have been a different story. But I'm trying not to live in my nature. I try to walk in the spirit of God. But I did feel sorry for him because he's a victim of his own thinking. And mm. so, but I did respect, I knew two things. Uh, we have to learn to give those in authority respect. Uh, and, 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 you know, that we would be right. And the second thing is we have to keep them from making us have fear. And so I certainly didn't fear the brother and I wanted to respect him because he was in charge. And so I was polite to let him do his thing. And then I drove on and it didn't spoil my day. Amen. Amen. You know, whew, some of us would have, you know, handled that a little bit different. And then that outcome could have caused something else to happen. So Absolutely. I truly really thank God for for that. And you you talked about how and, and, and I love the way you brought out how, you know, we, we do have a natural nature. This is this is this flesh has to be crucified daily. Like this is not something, you know, you did when you first got saved so many years ago <laughs> and it, it stayed dead. I remember uh, Jesse Duplantis one time said many of us like to carry the old man around with us in the casket. So right, right, right. we can resurrect them and they can handle every situation. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. So, Apostle Bracey, um, just for a minute, can you give us a little bit of uh, information? I know you were you were in a group before you got saved. I believe it was called the uh, Pan-Africanism. Yeah. I believe. Congress. Amen. Amen. If you could just talk about that. A little bit uh, what you were a part of, uh, what you did, and and then how you transitioned into giving your life to Christ. Well, you know, Lavelle, uh, this struggle that we find ourselves in is not something that's new to me. Um, back in the early seventies, I was like I said, I was a member of the Pan African Congress, and our position was a position that we are all African people. It was not something that was popular back then. We were all African people. Uh, we're Africans in America, we're Africans in Europe, so forth and so on. And the premise was, is that everybody has a land base except for African people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so our thought process was that we need to establish a land base from which African people could have some degree of respect and order and to move forward uh, in, 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 in the world. It's interesting because we, we're not necessarily uh, a non-violent group. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't necessarily, how do I say this? We weren't violent, but we recognized that things don't change unless a demand is placed on it. So Frederick Douglass says that power yields to nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. 
and the position that we have as African Americans in this country will not change until we put pressure, bring pressure to bear on the system that has uh, discriminated against us and held us down for like now for over 400, 400 years. So that's where I was. It was a deep time in my life. There were times, well, you know, we studied weaponry and the martial arts. Um, there were times when Stokely Carmichael and other militants would come to Detroit and I would be a part of the security team that would work with them. So it was more Malcolm than Martin in those days. Uh, interesting enough, God had to deliver me from a spirit of bitterness uh, because as I understood history and I understood how African people were treated globally and specifically in the United States, there was some bitterness that rose up in me every time I began to think about it and look at the history behind it. And when I got saved, God had to deliver me from that. He had to deliver me from, actually, from a spirit a spirit of hate uh, because there were those that um, that I caused a lot of grief in their lives. Uh, uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't treat me bad. They didn't know me that well or anything, but it was just this hatred, this bitterness that I had toward white people in general, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, I guess it was more the system, but because they were in my face, then they suffered some of the blunt of my of my anger and my wrath. Like I said, when I got saved, there were actually people that I went back to and repented to to tell them that I was sorry because now Jesus Christ was in my life and he sent he saved me. By the same token, I'm not ignorant. You know, salvation does not make us ignorant of history and the political, the social, the economic ill of society are still there. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm at a place. Well, I'm still guarding my heart <laughs> because mm -hmm. as I began to even now reflect as I watch the, uh, the situation that's going on around the globe today and here in America, if I'm not careful, things begin to swell up that I thought perhaps were, were crucified, but it looks like some of these things may be resurrected. So right now I'm in a position of guarding my heart. So I thank God for, for saving me, but I'm not ignorant of the devices of Satan. And we have to do battle with those both in the realm of the spiritual, spiritual and the realm of the natural. Hey, man. And, you know, you know, you both alluded to the fact that, you know, we still have an old nature. So anybody out there that's watching right now, you know, feelings that come up are 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 natural. They, you know, literally they're not they're our natural human nature. The anger that we have when we see what happened to uh, uh, Ahmaud Arbery. When we see what happened to George Floyd, you know, it brings up it brings up feelings. But. As you heard Apostle Bracey and Bishop Jones say, you know, that's something that we have to continue to fight to 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 kill that old nature. Amen. So, Apostle Coleman, um, now I know if you could just for a minute, just talk about there was a situation that happened to you when you were a teenager. And uh, when you were first running for judge, I had the blessed opportunity to play you in a commercial. <laughs> Amen. I truly appreciate you for even allowing me to do that. But there was a situation that happened at a store to you. And can you just tell us a little bit about that situation? And, and did that did, did that situation help make you want to go into the legal system to become an attorney and, and a judge? Well, thank you again, uh, Lavelle, for uh, allowing me to be a part of this forum. And uh you were, uh, you, you, as always, you did an outstanding job in playing me, and uh, that's a that's a hard that's a hard thing to do. We won't tell we won't tell people how many years ago that was. We'll just point out that at that time I had I had no gray hair whatsoever. So that's been a lot of years ago. Uh, but you were reenacting uh, an event that occurred uh, when I was 14 years old. I was working in that actual store where you, <clears throat> where we uh, we filmed that commercial. Uh, and while in that store, it was robbed by, uh, by five individuals. And uh, those individuals, uh, they came in almost like a, a gang and uh, they all had guns and they accosted myself and the, uh, uh, the owner of the store and they commanded, uh, and it, actually there was another person in the store as well on the other side of the counter. So they, they had all of us on the floor. They, uh, uh, they, they knew where all of the weapons were that were in the, uh, uh, in the store. Uh, so it was an inside job. We later found out that the owner's stepson set it up. Mm. Well, the, and the long and short of that is uh, during this robbery where they're taking things, they're also firing uh, weapons into the ceiling. Uh, guns are being pointed at me, a rifle as well as pistols, and we're being threatened and so on and so forth. And after they had gotten everything and uh, and uh, before they left out of this, uh, well, as four of them left out of the store, the, the last individual 
um, uh, turned and fired a shot at the owner of the floor who was on the, who was lying on, on the floor, and uh, that uh, that bullet uh, penetrated his heart and so it, it killed him. And mm. he's the same guy stood there with the weapon and uh, and looked at me and I, I looked at him and pleaded with him that he not take my life. And by the grace of God, I'm still here. Um, it, it's a tragedy because those are five individuals whose lives uh, were impacted other than the three uh, persons that were in the store and uh, one person lost their life. And uh, my life was forever changed on that evening at 14 years old. Um, mm -hmm. th those individuals uh, that were involved in the robbery, <clears throat> uh, three, uh, three of them uh, were, were smart enough to take uh, a guilty plea to armed robbery and they did very little time in jail. The shooter was not given that opportunity and, uh, and one other individual uh, did not take the plea, so he went to trial on, on felony murder, uh, and they both were convicted. The, uh, the gentleman that did the shooting, he's still in prison now. And that's been, uh, uh, that's been uh, over 40 years. Uh, wow. Uh, 46 years to be exact. The other individual that was convicted on a life offense, he got out last year. The governor commuted his sentence. Uh, so that, that, uh, certainly that background uh, inspired me to want to pursue uh, a career in law. But also, you know, I grew up in the, I grew up in the church and uh, in growing up in the church, one of the things uh, that uh, I, I, I learned to begin to peer into was uh, Jesus as a, uh, as a deliverer, Jesus as one who uh, was an advocate for those uh, that were the disadvantaged of society. And, uh, and, and so I felt that if I could acquire more tools to work with, then I would be in a position to, uh, to advocate uh, for those that uh, were the, uh, the, the disadvantaged and underprivileged of society. And for certain, given the uh, history of African Americans in, uh, in these United States, um, we would tend to be uh, people that are disadvantaged and underprivileged, not by virtue of any lack of uh, talent or skill or, uh, or, 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 or ability, and I should say uh, um, perhaps undeveloped ability because of lack of opportunity. Uh, the lack of opportunity would be the only reason why we could not excel. And the history of this country is rich with denial of opportunity to, mm -hmm. uh, to African Americans. And the reality of it is, is that uh, uh, we, we, we arrive on this land uh, for the purpose of some form of servitude that all ultimately ends up into uh, adject slavery and all of the cruelties thereof uh, that uh, was sustained in this country for many, many years. And not, uh, and it's so serious that it, it caused a major division in the country, uh, as we all know, the, the, the Civil War. And, uh, and even after that, um, the failure of Reconstruction and the, the emergence of Jim Crow. So, these social ills and these uh, racist uh, issues that uh, have uh, have been a part of the uh, black presence in America uh, uh, before uh, its uh, emergence as a country and throughout its history are the are issues that continue to raise their head today. And as Apostle Bracey uh, pointed out, uh, there are uh, many of us that have varying uh, perspectives about how we address that. And uh, those perspectives range from uh, the sense of wanting uh, to to uh, to lift up a violent revolution, uh, to trying to find a way to be conciliatory and reconciling and bridging uh, the gap so that uh, maybe we can live up to the creed of our country uh, that all men are created equal uh, and, and are endowed with certain inalienable rights. So that's with all of those perspectives were a part of what caused me to want to pursue uh, a career in law, and that's that's what I've done. And in the last uh, uh, the last 20, 28 years, um, I've been serving as a as a judge. And, well, that's an opportunity to meet out fairness and uh, to balance justice and things along those lines. And although it seems to be a small place in the world, nonetheless, for the individuals that appear in front of me, uh, that is their day in court. And there's something very rich about uh, addressing the fact that I know that every person that uh, that interfaces uh, with the, the system that I'm involved with uh, will have a fair and just opportunity to be treated regardless of their race, creed, religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a promise of this country. Moreover, 
uh, and more significantly, it is the promise of, uh, of Scripture. It is the promise of, of how we should be as the people of God, those that are ardent defenders of righteousness, ardent defenders of, of what is just. And, uh, and just as we are ardent defenders of that and, and, and uh, ready to, to fight that cause, we have to be, uh, we have to be those who, uh, those who are, are, uh, are on the cutting edge. Uh, we, we have to be those who are, are uh, well studied and pay attention to current affairs and put them in historical context as well as in the context of our present time. And then uh, use real time uh, understanding of the word of God uh, so that we apply it to uh, to uh, impact the lives uh, that are in, in, in our world. So I hope I answered the question. And one of the things I, I know I have problems sometimes is answering all of the questions, uh, even the ones you didn't ask. So I hope that I, uh, I, hope that I was able to, to, to reel it in a little bit. <laughs> no, you definitely answered the question. So, all right, all right, all right. So before we go in, before we actually get into the questions here, I did want to let me give a, let me first give a shout out to your amazing wives. So Apostle mm -hmm. Coleman, I know you are celebrating an anniversary next week. Um, so we want to give a shout out to Sister Shay Coleman, Amen. Amen. And uh, Apostle Bracy, I know uh, a couple of months ago you and Apostle Carolyn celebrated uh, fifty-one years of marriage. 51, uh, so, yes, sir. Man, awesome. so congratulations to Thank Apostle you, uh, you and, and shout out to Apostle Carolyn. And uh, Bishop, I know this month you and Pastor Brenda, shout out to her, will be celebrating 50 years of marriage. Oh, my. <laughs> they have to tell me what they do because they both of them still have hair on the top of their head. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to, Use glue. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to figure something out. <laughs> all, all I can say is that LaKenya and I are trying to catch up with y'all. You know, um, I was we were truly honored because each of you uh, got a chance to speak into our lives uh, prophetically during our wedding ceremony. So, again, thank you all so, so much. And the words that you all spoke are coming to pass. We are expecting our firstborn son Next time, uh, in September. So, wow. amen. Well, Amen. we know what you guys have been doing, you know, praying right. and seeking the face of God. I'm telling you, we are so inspired. All right. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so before we jump into the questions, I did want to I did want to just say that I, I wanted I want to define something right now. I just I just want to define something. So I believe that 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 black lives matter. I do. But when you hear me refer to black lives matter. I just want to make it very clear. This is just me. I am not referring to the Black Lives Matter organization. I am speaking of Black Lives Matter as a movement. So I just wanted to make that very, very clear. When you hear me speak of Black Lives Matter, which I do believe in, I do support, I am not speaking of the organization. I had a chance to go to their website and read what, what they stand for. So I'm not speaking of the organization. I'm speaking of the movement. I do believe that Black Lives Matter. And I just wanted to show this real quick. This is something I saw on my friend's friend Breon's uh, Facebook page, and I had to copy it. It says, it says, for, for my all lives matter, folks. When the Boston Marathon was bombed, everybody's pro profile picture said Boston strong. Nobody said all city strong. When Las Vegas, the shooting happened. People change their profiles. Stand with Vegas. Nobody said, well, what about the people that got shot in my city? Have you ever seen someone counter a breast cancer post with, what about colon cancer? But for some reason, if someone says Black Lives Matter, it turns into all-inclusive, all lives matters. It's not an either-or proclamation. When there's a crisis, we have always rallied around that particular group. It doesn't discredit or diminish any other group. It just brings awareness and support to the group that needs attention. So I just wanted to I just wanted to post that and say that right now, you know, with, with these deaths and, and, and again, uh, Apostle Bracey, you did a, a, um, a, 
you you all can go to the Shiloh Deliverance page. He did about a forty five minute teaching, and uh, you know he's talking. This isn't anything new. You know, it's not black people are not just now starting to get killed. Right. This is something that we've been 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 dealing with and and going through for you know a long long time. But but when it when it happens, you know it's like. It, it, it brings this shock and it brings this feeling up. So I'm going to I'm going to go to Bishop Jones for the first question. Bishop, how do we deal with this climate of racial injustice right now? We have this this, this climate of racial injustice going on. So just we as black people, Bishop, can you give us any practical advice on how to deal with this with this climate of racial racial injustice? Wow, that's great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, we I kind of look at it differently, and certainly I, I got all the all the history and stuff. I was around in the '68 riots and all that kind of stuff, and I had all kind of guns and people. Uh, we are in a, a oppressed people because of the fact that we were brought here to be enslaved to me, and somewhere in the heart and the mind of those who are in charge, you know, they just need to be supreme. And so uh, we don't have just a racial problem. We have truly, we have a heart problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the people's heart. And uh, it's what they, you know, what they have in their heart. And unfortunately, we get the brunt of that evil in the heart. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence. But out of it are the issues of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, some kind of way, uh, these people who are trying to seem superior really have low self-esteem. And they're fearful. And God has graced us as a people, you know, and he graced everybody uh, to be able to uh, succeed. And that's that's threatening to a lot of folks. So there's a whole lot of oppression just to hold their supremacy. And unfortunately, uh, in this time, uh, unless we can change people's heart, because two wrongs don't make a right, there's not much can do. Uh, I'm watching the protest, but the real deal is Unless we can change the laws and um, use the law as a deterrent, mm -hmm. um, a person will feel threatened by the deterrent of the law, then we're wasting our time because marching in the street and protesting will not change people's heart. And uh, most folks don't know, and uh, police have immunity, you know what I'm saying? And so if you, if you have a heart full of hatred, and you, you need to feel superior, then that's the place to go. Go where you can have authority and space and misuse people and know you're gonna be justified or excused by the law, but there's no deterrent. So I, I would say that we have to be wise enough to know that we're dealing with demonic attitudes or hearts or spirit and just be wise. If we're gonna do something, let's change the laws on the books, you know, and uh, whatever it takes to do that, uh, I was I was around long enough to be in the Black Panther, <laughs> and you know we're gonna take over. You know we had a twenty-two rifle and about forty bullets, <laughs> and I'm like, how in the world are we gonna take over? You know we're gonna demand five states, and we're going through all the drills and stuff. And yes, one day I just come to myself, this is crazy. What's gonna happen when I get through shooting my forty bullets? <laughs> I got nobody backing me up. The people want to suppress me. And so I just got out, you know, and uh, I thank God I got saved. Uh, but certainly uh, uh, we have to recognize the, they are in authority, are they in authority because they're in power, but we can change the laws, level the playing field, and then learn how to love each other by changing people's heart. Hey, man, I, you know, I, I, I agree. 100% that, you know, we have to certainly change our hearts. That's where it starts. It's a, you know, there are so many people that consider themselves black men first and sons of Christ second. And I just feel like they have that out of order. I think we are children of God first. And once we realize that, then we can handle things from a spiritual aspect as opposed from a natural aspect. As all of you all said, this has been happening for years, way before any of you were even born, this was happening. So this isn't a, 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 a natural issue, Bishop. This is 
like you said, this is a spiritual issue. And, and even as you had to change your heart and Apostle Bracey, Apostle Coleman, myself, we all had to change our hearts. The only way that we're going to reach the world for Christ or change this racial climate is through changing our hearts. Well, let me just say this, and I don't want to dominate the thing, is that oh, I, if I would be honest, mm -hmm. and if I could just be honest, blatantly honest, yes, sir. my heart has not changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> and so, but the scripture says that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I try to walk in his grace or his spirit and try to deny myself. If I would really respond to what has been ingrained in me, then I would probably be just as bad as the other people. They just have to be in more power. But the whole ideal is not to walk in self. We are to represent Christ. And there's two things that every believer should be after in pursuit of, and that's the enablement of God for power and the character of Christ, which are the fruits of the spirit. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I, um, a young lady told me, my wife was talking to one guy, he, said, he was saying, I never seen you angry. And my wife said, you don't want to see me. <laughs> 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 I, I'm from the east side. <laughs> That's all I can say. You know? <laughs> so, uh, I, I ask for grace every day, every moment. I had to ask for grace when that guy was hollering at me. I'm like, nobody told you to step out the car in front of my, out the truck in front of my car. And he act like he was my father or God or something. I mean, you're a fireman. But I just allowed him to do a thing because I had some grace on me, you know. And Amen. I really felt like I could have whipped him too. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you. Thank God you didn't. We, we, no, definitely, no, didn't, we definitely didn't want to see the headline that uh Detroit <laughs> Bishop beats up firemen. And <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So Apostle, Apostle Bracey, um, this next question, what can we do or put in place to initiate change as people of color in the United States? And I know that's a, that's extremely broad, but just, I know you spoke a little bit about it in the uh, teaching that you did, but, but what are some things that we can do um, to put in place to initiate change just as, as people of color? Okay, let me, let me say this. I'm not about trying to change a racist heart. Mm. His heart is what it is, and I don't have the ability to change it. I can, right. however, change his behavior toward me. So if he right. comes to me with a knife and I pull out a pistol, his behavior changes. <laughs> so what, what, we, what we are about is putting the, they're putting into place. <laughs> Y'all laugh at me. What we are about, I like it. I like I'm it. Putting, in, putting into place systems that will will we'll halt that. You know, Frederick Douglass said, well, power yields to nothing without demand. It never has, and it never will. But racism will not end unless a demand is placed on it. You know, it's interesting. I think one thing, I'll say this, I thank God because right now God is on our side. You know, the root of racism, the branches of racism, the fruit of racism, God hates. You know, mm -hmm. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, six things God hates. The seventh is abomination. He hates a haughty eye, proud look. Racism is based on a, on a haughty eye, a proud look that, that you're better than me and that I'm subhuman. He hates a lying tongue, uh, hands that shed innocent blood, uh, a heart that defies wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, bearing false witness and sowing the seeds of discord among the brethren. That, that is racism in, in the Bible. And mm. those people whose hearts have been given over that for over years and years and years again, not about changing their heart. But we have to develop systems uh, that we're able to, to function in and operate in that will change their behavior. Uh, Bishop just mentioned the idea of, uh, of politics. You know, essentially you mentioned when I first got when I first got saved, I was getting saved out of the Pan-African Congress. And in that day, in that day, everything was get saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, that was a mighty burning fire. But really, there in the church, there was no teaching on, on, on political strategies or economic strategies or, or, or social strategies. Those things weren't taught. We were just trying to get saved, be saved, and get somebody else saved. And at the same time, the world was moving forward and racist ideologies and programs were still being implemented 
and it was just kind of pushed to the back burner. But to answer your question, I think one of the things that we need to do immediately uh, is to begin to teach our young people who they are. They need to know who they are in Christ Jesus. They need to know who they are in the world. They need to know they're fearfully and wonderfully made, that they have value. They have the capacity to do great things. From a political standpoint, uh, for example, when I got saved back during that season, uh, nobody talked about running for judge at that time or or, or getting mm -hmm. into politics. Politics was dirty. Saints didn't get involved in politics, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But what do we need? We need people that are in decision-making positions that have capacity to make godly decisions and decisions that will benefit us as an African, as an African people. You know, people say, well, that's lopsided. Well, listen, the Apostle Paul said, his heart's desire for Israel, they be saved. Our desire for our people is that we have some, some justice in this country. The struggle that we're involved in right now is a just cause. It's just cause. Remember when David went up against uh, Goliath, one of the first things he said when he got to battle. Is there not a cause? Our cause is a just cause. And, and it, does, it does not take away from the fact that we love God, we love people, we want to advance his kingdom, but there are still realities that we have to deal with. So from, from a political standpoint, everybody needs to vote. We need to recognize that, you know, the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Righteousness mm -hmm. is the alternation. The sin is real approach to any people. Then if my people to call by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive the sin, and, he, and, heal, and heal the land. So we need to recognize that when, there, when, there's, when, there's, uh, when there's treachery in government, we need to pray God deliver from the treacherous, let, uh, uproot the treacherous, pull them down, and let the righteous step in. But at the same time, we didn't do what we need to do. Racism has fallen on two levels. And you've already said it. It's fallen first in the realm of the spirit because racism is a spirit. And unless it's broken in the realm of the spirit, it'll never be broken in the realm of the natural. So it has to be broken in the realm of the spirit. That's when we take the full arm of God. That's when we go into prayer. That's when we see God for wisdom and insight for, as far as divine strategies to break this thing. And once it's broken in the realm of the spirit, then it can break broken in the realm of the natural. But we need to do everything that we can from a political standpoint, you know, we need to vote and get some righteous people in. We need to pray that righteous people will begin to go into politics. From an economic standpoint, we need to understand the biblical principles of finances. We need to understand how this free enterprise system works and then work the system. We need to understand all of these things. The educational system has erased us until, until recent years. Uh, we need to have some people writing books. We need to get some people to become teachers and uh, teaching our people the reality of their history. Now, again, save, sanctify through the Holy Ghost, but there's a reality after we deal with, have to deal with. We have to deal with this thing on two fronts, in the realm of the spiritual and then in the realm of the natural. All of us have a center of influence. I think we need to start, number one, in our families. It's, it's, it, start, it starts there, you know? It starts in our families and then our communities, then in the church, you know? I think some people are looking for some... Uh, some great one to rise up. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking for another Malcolm, another Marcus Garvey, another, um, I can say T.C. and Lay Overture, another, another Martin Luther King. You know, I don't think we need a choir director. We need a choir. We need <laughs> all of us doing what we can do to cause this thing to, to change. So that's kind of where I'm at with that one. <laughs> hey, man. I, you know, I, um, the late Apostle V.B. Washington had me teaching a class at the Church to the Young Men uh, called uh, Man in Demand. It was the, uh, the the young men of the church. And I remember I would always teach them because I work at the Marriott. And when Marriott first took over, there was a lot of, of people coming in that were very, very, you know, racist. I don't even know how else to, how else to say it. Yeah. But one thing I never did, and one thing my mother taught me and, and Apostle VB taught me, and I saw an example, as an example from all of you, is that I never put my head down. I always look people in their eyes um, and I would teach them that, you know, because a lot of uh, uh, younger black men, when a, when an older white person says something to them, they'll, they'll look down. Yes, sir. You know, they, but I told them, don't never look down, look, look people directly in their eyes. And I think that gives you a, um, a sense of, of, of being emboldened, you know, and, 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 you know, being standing firm. So, Amen, Apostle. I agree. And voting is, I think, something that, that we definitely have to do. Uh, next week on this program, I'm going to uh, have a young lady that's running for state representative and also Apostle Coleman's daughter. 
I'm going to have her on the show. She's running for a uh, judge as well. She's an oh, attorney. Geez. All right. Yeah. So, so we're going to have them on the show to just to talk to young people about voting and getting out there. When, when President Obama ran, every black person in the country voted. But this last time we didn't get yeah. as many votes and we see what we see what we got, you know. <laughs> Amen. Wow. All right. So, Apostle Coleman, what should our mindset be in relation to race in America. We're going to we're going to deal with the church a little bit later because there have been some um some insensitive comments from some white church leaders, mega church leaders. Um so we'll deal with that a little bit later, but just 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 talk to us for a minute on what should our mindset be in relation to to race in America. Well, I think that uh, uh well first of all, shout out and uh prayers to all of the the families who have suffered over time and recently uh, at the hands of uh, law enforcement and other systems that uh, that that clearly uh, uh, appends itself to uh, to uh, racial overtones that have resulted in the uh, the death of uh, young men and young women, and also uh, to those uh, individuals who were uh, going about minding their own business and uh, uh, bird watching. And, and uh, uh, and other activities where uh, where uh, it has become a, a weapon for uh, for white people and white women in particular to call the police on on uh, on black men and, uh, and and get them in in life threatening kind of situations. It is just one strand of what uh, of what is uh, you know what is wrong with uh, what is wrong with America. Um, it, it, it runs with the entire. Uh, the entire history and the entire blood of, of this country. So we have to be, we have to have our uh, proper moorings. And I think that some of the things that Apostle Bracey talked about uh, is critically important uh, as well as Bishop Jones. And that is, we have to, we have to reimagine how we have been teaching and how we've been instructing uh, uh, our families and how we've been instructing uh, the people uh, around us in terms of how uh, to relate to their history, how to relate to who they are as a person, and how to address the issues of the day, and uh, the reality that they cannot afford to uh, they they cannot afford to be asleep at the wheel. Uh, we have to think about that. It's only been uh, in the uh, the 60s when the uh, the first civil rights uh, bill was passed. We're talking about 1960 <laughs> in the 1960s, and so that that's not been a long time ago where uh, it was finally noted that there were some rights that we actually uh, had that could be uh, made a part of the uh, Constitution applied to the states by the uh, 14th Amendment, uh, so certain equal protections and so on and so forth. So the history of, uh, of Black people in America having, uh, having any rights is relatively, uh, relatively uh, very recent. And so our our mentality must be to build systems that are designed to create uh, people who have a anti-racist mentality. People who uh, I'm talking about among us, uh, people who uh, have an intolerance for that which is race, uh, that that which is racism, and, uh, and 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 able to identify it, able to define it, able to see it as it really is, and able to uh, respond to it. Uh, with wisdom and with strategies. And obviously, one of the things that has not been a, a good strategy in many situations is to even try to put up the smallest amount of the assertion of rights when stopped by certain law enforcement persons because mm -hmm. uh, asserting uh, uh, rights and saying that you can't do that to me has oftentimes resulted in individuals being killed. And this is not to... Uh, to, to speak against many of the people that I know as friends and otherwise who are involved in law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we know, given the events that we have seen uh, recently, the only reason that we're seeing these events now is because of technology. Let's just face it, that uh, it wasn't right, that right. it wasn't that technology got started and so people started doing stuff because now there's technology. No, no, no. The stuff was going on all its time, but now the technology is there that these moments can be captured, and individuals could have to face some type of justice because of uh, because of those things being captured. We know that even when 
uh, activities are captured that oftentimes there is no uh, ultimate conviction because there's been such uh, uh, such a respect for quote unquote the law and those who are a part of the law such that if they they do something uh, juries in many instances will give them a pass on it mm -hmm. well we, we come to we come to another day and I think that the day that we're in now is we almost have to understand ourselves um, we almost have to understand ourselves as being like Daniel and the, and the Hebrew boys, uh, how they, they end up in Babylon through no fault of their own. They are taken from their, their native land and they are brought there. And although not as slaves, they are brought there in the, and they are subject to uh, the laws and the system that is at work in Babylon. And so Daniel and his friends, uh, the first thing that they do is they master the system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you read the Daniel account and Daniel and his and his uh, friends were 10 times wiser than those that were of Babylon. They knew Babylon better than Babylon knew Babylon. They were they knew it 10 times better. They were, were 10 times more strategic than those that were of Babylon. And so uh, uh, because of that, uh, they were able to navigate the systems of Babylon without compromising the systems of the kingdom. And so we have to be able to navigate Babylon and have a systemic approach to navigating Babylon and not hold that to ourselves, but teach that to everybody that we know so that they can effectively navigate Babylon, making changes along the way. You know that Daniel became one of the, um, he became the head over the presidents over, over Babylon. He became a, a key leader and he was able to affect uh, policy. He still needed uh, God, because, you know, lion's dens and, and fiery furnaces and stuff, God's going to have to intervene in, in, in certain uh, supernatural situations. But Daniel was at the table of the policy making. His friends were at the table of the policy making. And so we have to raise up a generation that will be um, that will be determined to be at the table where the policies are made and determined to have the mentality of people uh, like Daniel that are willing to pray, that are willing to fast, but also are willing to study also willing to understand and discern. And, uh, Apostle Bracey said uh, something about, uh, uh, basically what he, he was talking about is we have to understand how things work. You don't understand how things work when people get a chance to take advantage of you because you don't understand how it works. We need to understand economy. I, I went back to school a, a few years ago uh, to get my uh, my master's in business administration. I mean, you know, I was the, I was, uh, one of the, the most senior members in the uh, in the class among all of these young people. But I wanted to have a better understanding of how business works, how economies work. And I, I've studied these things before, but I wanted to get updated on being able to understand systems because if we don't understand how systems work, number one, we can't attack them. And number two, we can't make them work effectively to our advantage if they are systems that are salvageable. And so we we've got to have we've got to have uh, we've got to have strategies at hand, and a uh, part of those strategies will dovetail into the, into the opportunity to to prophesy and declare the word of the Lord. And let's remember that when the king had a dream, that it was the king that was searching for someone to give a prophetic utterance, to give an understanding and interpretation. It was not Daniel thrusting himself out there. The king found himself in a peculiar situation where. He saw something that he could not understand, that he could not perceive. And the word of the Lord lets us know in Isaiah uh, chapter number two, that there's going to come a time where the church is going to be at the top of the hill mm -hmm. and the nations are going to flow into it saying, show us your way. We, we've got to be those that have the ability to, to articulate the ways of God. Now, I know, I know we're getting in, into the church. I'm talking about the mindset of young men and young women, we have to train a certain mindset uh, that is not uh, obsequious, that's not willing to just bow down to the systems that are at hand, but who are sophisticated. They know what their rights are, they understand who they are, and they know how to navigate their way through, uh, through this world. And as they do that, triggers will be pulled, uh, buttons will be pushed, and there will be the opportunity to force the system into a change. It should not have to be the way that it is, the way that it was with, with Floyd. Imagine how that officer felt so much privilege that he could sit there in front of a crowd of people pleading with him to not take this man's life. And I would, I would say, if you uh, look, look at or listen to and watch the video, 
There are even white people in the in, in the in the video saying to him, stop. So, you know, I mean, it, 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 there was such a sense of privilege that nothing will happen to me. Uh, it's the same thing that uh, the people that brought us here and over the years uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the late 1800s and the 1900s, all of this lynching and stuff that took place. It was people that felt that they had the privilege and the right to do whatever they wanted to do and that there would be no consequences to that. So we have to we have to raise up a generation that will have uh, a mindset like Daniel and his friends that even though they were not of Babylon, even though they they, they longed for the motherland, uh, even though they were not brought there of their own volition, that once they were there, they were a force to be a force to be reckoned with. And some of us have been successful at doing that in our silos, in our small worlds. You know, um, uh, Bishop Jones, uh, uh, one of the the, the, the best uh, pastors and leaders and church developers that. Uh, anywhere, development of men and development of, uh, of women who are productive and advancing and moving forward and what have you. This is uh, this is uh, a church uh, type leadership, but you, you you put another hat on that. That is nation building. You put a, you put another hat on that. That is building economies because why? If you build up people and you strengthen people and you cause them to understand who they are. Then they go and they, they get jobs, they open businesses, they, 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 they uh, develop finances and so on and so forth. And before you know it, you've got, you've got people that have sustainability. And what we're yet to really have in this nation is sustainability. You have to ask the question, how could smart people like uh, Lavelle, uh, myself, Apostle Bracey, Apostle Jones, how could smart people like us uh, be people of color in America, black people in America, and people can still do in America what they did to George Floyd. And then mm -hmm. they can talk about, well, you know, black on black crime. Well, there's a higher percentage of white on white crime than there is black on black crime in America. Most white people uh, that are killed are killed by other white people. But they want to talk about how many black people kill black people. That's not the issue. The issue, the issue has to do with the systemic racism that exists in this country. And we have to get good mm -hmm. definitions. We have to understand it. And we have to be unwilling to relent on what those things are. And uh, and so, uh, and, and some of the some of the writings uh, that we have to go to, uh, they may be uh, secular people that have written things that give us good histories and uh, good ability to to read a book and get a real good understanding of of the timelines and how things came together and how to think about stuff. And then our job as those that are proclaimers of the word of God and preachers and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we, we know how to we know how to bring the gospel together with that. We know how to we know how to infuse it in what God gave us to do. But kind of like the first message that Jesus gave, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, Luke four, like the first message that Jesus gave is he's baptized and he's ready to go. He said, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. What? To set the captives free, to set at liberty those that are bound, you know, recovering of sight to the blind. Jesus is a liberator, and we must have the gospel of liberation uh, at work in our hearts as well. And we must be able to navigate or teach uh, people how to navigate in this society in such a way that our impact cannot be missed. It cannot be missed. And yes, in this season, I, I know I'm beyond the question, but in this season that we're in right now, uh, things are at, have come to a boiling point, as they should. Just think about this uh, pandemic that... Uh, can is it, not handled uh, from a political standpoint the way that it should should be handled. Then you think about the impact on the economy. We're in the midst of a a unnamed recession. So we have a pandemic. We have a disease that's infecting. Fifty thousand people were uh, tested. Uh, Fifty thousand people tested positive for the infection today. Uh, we're getting back to that rate where at least a thousand people are dying a day. Whatever it is. And then we have an economy that is that is tanking, and people that are marginally, uh, structurally out of uh, pushed out of economic participation. And you know that when it's a when it's a recession for other people, it's a hell depression for black people. And, and so you know we 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 got to understand that how how these things affect us, and how we have to be on task to understand these systems and make sure. That, uh, that we're dealing with this stuff. So we're dealing with a pandemic, we're dealing with an economic crisis, and then we're dealing with a civil crisis that there are some people that would love to make it a civil war. I mean, you, 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 it, it, listen, uh, a lot, we got some people who want to call Black Lives Matter a hate group. 
Well, you know, listen, there may be some elements of that involved in that, but the reality of it is, is that we have hate groups all over the place. We have white supremacists. And we have we got a president that will tweet a message saying white power. This is what we have going on right now. So if 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 there is an impetus to push this issue uh, in a confrontation matter, then what we're looking at is we're looking at people that see this as a ripe opportunity to create a civil war type of type of situation. And so here's my here's really my heart on this matter. I, I've given, I've given word to my people. We're not people of fear in any kind of way, but I've given word to my people that surrounding uh, the latter part of this year as we approach that time, talking about uh, coming up to the election and leading into the new year, I'm teaching and instructing my people for a different mentality and a different kind of preparation. Because, beloved, we don't know what's going to be the fallout leading up to and right after this election. Uh, <laughs> I, to the, the suggestion that we're going to have an election, say, on the second or whatever it is, and then on the third, all is going to be fine and well, and we're going to move on, and, and everybody's going to celebrate that either the, the president is staying or a new president is coming in in January. I believe that there is going to be some level of pandemonium that's going to break out. And we've got to be prepared and we got to prepare our people because the tensions that caused a civil war in the 1860s are the tensions that are existing right now. The okay. tensions that caused the, that, that caused the uh, period of reconstruction to be demolished and the rights of African-Americans to be completely taken away and the South to be turned back into the hands of uh, the Southern Democrats who, uh, who, who turned it into Jim Crow for from from uh, like 1880 all the way up to, to 1960. Imagine that uh, there was an opportunity that the country had from 1865 up to 1885 to really turn the, the tide on what the, the nation had been as a racial nation and, and racist nation. But when the South was turned back and uh, uh, Jim Crow laws and all of the abuse that was able to take place, the federal troops were moved out of that. That created a system that lingered all the way up until the 60s. And there are people right now who are unhappy with the fact that I can be called a man just like they're called a man. And they, and they live with that. And they're looking for the opportunity for there to be a, enough friction that, a, that a, a civil type war can break out. And so we got to be wise in this regard. We got we to be strategic. We got to be prepared. Uh, and, then, and when I say prepared, I'm talking about you know, food and water, and butter and bread, guns. More than forty and bullets. More than forty bullets. I'm not talking minutes. about forty bullets. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about forty bullets. I'm talking. I'm talking about something that will empty forty bullets faster, than, <laughs> faster than they used to. But yes, I mean, I'm, I, all I'm saying is that you know we have to be. Listen. Oh my God. I, I, I'm gonna say this and then I'll quit. I promise you, about Sorry to take up the time. Like no, this. no, you good. Amen. We, we, listen, we 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 deal with the reality that even as we speak, there are people that claim church salvation, godliness, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, uh, support for uh, you know pro life and everything else, but they still have a problem yeah. coming to grips with black people, yeah. uh, and they 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 are they have. Well, many of them have full churches preaching. To, you know, uh, the reality is that uh, Sunday morning has been the most segregated time in all of America. Uh, you, you know, it's very, very interesting. Black folks have always uh, found a way to support others. And you can find churches where there is a, a white leader and where there is a good mix and a bunch of black people there and maybe others and so on and so forth. T.D. Jakes is the premier preacher in America. He's written books. He's been on every program you can name. Everybody knows him. You look at the Potter's house on Sunday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How is it? How is it that he could be a premier preacher in America? Everybody know him. He's written books everywhere. He's on Oprah. He's on uh, you name it. There he is. And then you you look at his church. And if there if there are ten thousand people sitting there, find a hundred white people. Why is that? We have to. We really have to come to grips with those things. I know I'm, I'm over in the other thing now, so I'm, I'm gonna leave that alone. You guys. <laughs> Lavelle, uh, I apologize if I went too far, but I have a lot more to say there. Um, I have a couple of books I want to recommend, but maybe we do that a little bit later in the program. Uh, just so, you know, one of my favorites is is uh, is how how to be an anti-racist. 
how to be an anti-racist by mm -hmm. Ibram Kendi. Ibram Kendi, Kendi, K-E-N-D-I is the last name. Uh, how to be an anti-racist. He also wrote Stamp, uh, Stamp from the Beginning. And that's a history of, of what happened to black people and how we got to where we are. Just history, you know, mm -hmm. you, 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 he's not trying to preach to you anything, just, just history. And then giving a good definition of racism. You know, a lot of times people talk about racism and they say, well, it's because they just hate us and they, so people are just bitter towards people. But listen, racism, you know, slavery and uh, racial policy was economically beneficial to a lot of people. So Absolutely. some of it was, you know, I, I hate you as an aside, but, you know, it, it, the hate is not really the biggest issue for me. The biggest issue is that I am economically prospering because of this system rigged the way that it is. And if you got to be a slave or you got to be someone that can't get a loan for a home or you got to be someone uh, that we can take advantage of for me to be enriched, then, hey, yeah, yeah, I want that system to stay that way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Apostle Bracey, again, was talking about how we have to hit it, hit where it hurts. Uh, so now we're getting some changes in even how social media platforms things that you're seeing people fired from jobs. You know, uh, Amy Cooper got fired from her job at a at a lucrative uh, financial firm. The reason she got fired from her job is because that lucrative financial firm don't want people who's got a bunch of money pulling their money out of there and saying, I'll go to the firm down the street because you got Amy Cooper there who is standing in the park with a bird watcher uh, uh, weaponizing her phone and calling the police and saying that he's attacking her. So she got mm -hmm. fired. So what we have to do is we have to create those situations where uh, where where it is economically, uh, it is, is to their economic disadvantage to perpetuate this system. And, uh, yeah. and as we do that, I think that we begin to turn the tide. So we got to have a we got to have a balance of a militaristic mentality about changing a system that is wretched, changing uh, changing mindsets that are wretched and making them pay. But we also have to do it on the platform that Jesus said that we have to do it. He said that, he said we have to do it in love. The, the great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But all of us that have had children know something about love. You know something. If you never knew it and understood them about love, children will teach you about love. And that is that love has to have some correction, some justice, and all that kind of stuff mixed with it. Otherwise, you're gonna be you're gonna be loved and ruled over, stamped on, uh, mistreated, and abused uh, because all you know how to do is to show that mushy kind of love. No, love love is constructive behavior. It's a balanced response and balance of. Uh, dealings with, with with people that you interface with, you know. I love you enough to tell you that you're racist. I love you enough to tell you that that you're wrong. I love you enough to tell you that your your approach is uh, is, is not sustainable, that it's unrighteous, that it's ungodly. It don't matter if you it don't matter if you're a preacher, you know. If we're mm -hmm. together and we you know we're together and we're having a good meal together, and we you know high five and praising the Lord and everything. You say something racist, then it's racist. That's what it is. That's that's what it is. Right. And that's right. what got. Uh, Dr. Frederick Casey Price going, you know, you know, he's linked into all of those folks some years ago. And, right. and uh, you know, he got a tape with some, uh, you know, some discussions that they were having. He's like, whoa, I thought we were all saved. <laughs> said, well, <laughs> well, no, you know, and he said, well, you got to apologize at least. I said, no, no, we're not apologizing. That's the way that he feels. And he ended up uh, preaching and doing a series of books. <laughs> he got, got the brother fired up because these are real issues and they are not inconsequential. People get hurt. Families get destroyed. Uh, uh, all kind of dangerous uh, stuff happens in our society because sometimes we we feel like uh, they couldn't possibly be that bad. They couldn't possibly be that mean. Well, racism is ugly. That that, that stuff is ugly. I mean, it, this this system is 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 wretched. Um, uh, imagine someone uh, uh, on their way home and uh, walking home from a store uh, with uh, with a mask on during this pandemic or whatever and uh, gets gets stopped and he's crying why are you stopping me why the 100 and 140 pound young man uh i believe it's in colorado 140 pound young man they, all of a sudden they they're sitting on him and, and and choking him and then you got coroners that are saying well uh he he, he died because his his heart stopped beating uh, uh hmm. no no he died because he got choked and because uh, 200 pound people had their knee in his back you know, the same thing, the same kind of stuff came up in the Floyd situation. The coroner saying, well, he had some arterial sclerotic heart disease going on. And so, uh, uh, he, so he, he died. And by the way, there was a little bit of pressure on his neck. No, 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 no. He, we, we all saw the video. We know why he died. 
but this yeah. th this is systemic stuff. And if we don't address the stuff at the system level, then we won't be able to understand the readout, you know, the, the, the printout, what, what, what they're saying. It, but when we understand how stuff works, then we can attack the system properly because we know how stuff works and we demand something better than that. I, I, I hope I answered the question. I know I answered some questions. <laughs> well, you certainly blessed us. <laughs> hey, man. Um, actually, no, actually, that was an excellent segue into how do we deal with things uh, in the church. Um, but I, I, I do want to say you were talking about, you know, reading books that may be by secular. When I was in college, um, our professor had us to do a book report on a book. I had never heard of it. And I was so glad he introduced us to it. But at first, the Christian in me was like, oh, oh, I don't want to read this. But I was in college. I had to do it for the grade. But it, the, the name of the book is um, Black Labor, White Well. White Well. Yeah. Dr. Claude Anderson. Yeah. And yeah. that like That's a opened my eyes to things. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. Now, the problem is right now, is Dr. Anderson is still around. But uh, the book, you know, if, if you go to, to, to get that book down, that book is two hundred and ninety dollars. Oh, wow. That's because it's out of print and, and, and you you got to scrounge to get a copy of it. And people everywhere are trying to get a copy of that book now because of the time that we're in. But Dr. Claude Anderson, uh, uh, Black Labor, uh, uh, White Wealth, how uh, how uh, white people turn wealth. <laughs> how white people created wealth from the labor of black people. This is not stuff that you make up. This is not somebody uh, got in their feelings and thought they talk about that. This is historically uh, established. It's economically established. And uh, the wealth that is a, a critical part of this nation right now was founded on the system of slavery and black labor. That's the wealth that's created. Now it's converted now because they're working other other uh, systems and they're investing in other ways. But the key investments that gave rise to wealth in this country started with uh, with agri labor. It started with the, the labor. It started with labor produced by. Uh, started with products produced by free labor, <laughs> and uh, and it created huge wealth. And that wealth then, uh, as as uh, time went by, that wealth was invested in other industries and what have you. And some of the, uh, the the wealth that still exists now is because of black labor. And then you look at the condition of, of African Americans in, in the society, and uh, well, uh, that's another uh, subject. But yeah, Dr. Claude Anderson, black labor, black labor, white wealth. Is, you, you said you said it sells for two hundred, almost two hundred and ninety dollars. If you yeah. if you if you Google now to try to get that book, uh, the cheapest copy I saw was two hundred ninety. I got my copy, but I was just looking, you know. Uh, but that, that, that book says that the, the cheapest one I saw was $290 because people are trying to get their hands on it and there are so many, so few copies that are available. But that is a critical, that's a crucial book. It, it helps you to see exactly what happened. It's great, uh, great research that tracked exactly what happened. So that people can't hide behind, well, I got this because my family left it to me. Well, how, where'd your family get it from? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, let, let me let me say this. I just got a couple more questions. I'm not going to hold you all because, um, and I know Apostle, I know Apostle Coleman. I know you have a, a class that you have to teach very very soon. Um, but um, I, I did want to say this as we shift into the church. My wife and I were, were a couple weeks ago. We were studying the book of Jonah, and Jonah was a very very interesting prophet. You know, he God sent him to go to Nineveh to to, to proclaim that they were going to be destroyed. He didn't want to go. Of course, we know the, the, the main aspects of the story. He was thrown into the water. The, the fish swallowed him up later on after three days, spit him out on, on dry ground. But as we were studying, I noticed that his problem with God wasn't so much that he was scared to go. It was that he knew God was going to forgive them if they repented. He was sending yeah, it raises, them. It raises the a critical question. What, what do you do when you are sent? To deliver your oppressor. Yes, and that and that literally that's what my wife and I were talking about because the Ninevites held them in captivity and they did some atrocious things to them. Yes. They yes. would impale them, put their heads on sticks, and I mean they did some really terrible things to them in slavery. And now God is telling him to go proclaim judgment. But Jonah told God, I knew that if I went, you were gonna forgive them. And that's why he had an attitude with that's God. It. 
because he knew that he, he knew that God was going to forgive them. So, so I guess, I guess Bishop Jones, I guess I'll go to you. Um, <laughs> next. Uh, what can we do as the church to help initiate change in America? Just as the church, we dealt with it from the, you know, uh, racism from the point of view of, of, of America, but as the church, as men and women of God, just give us some practical advice on what we can do to help initiate change. Well, let me just say this, and it's a good question. I'm going to try to address it. Uh, one of the I've been pastoring 40 years, you know, going on a little over 40 years. And one of the regrets that I have as a pastor, as I look back, is that I, I, I bought the lie of the separation between church and state. Yeah. And while we was over teaching people how to go to heaven, the, the state was going, going great wealth and suppressing us and telling us to wait on the promise. And if we're gonna do something to change, we need to create a cause. And we need to know that God called us, he empowered us, he, he gave us his grace, his giftings to economize, uh, the earth and make it like heaven. And so what we've done is locked up and shouted and praise God and dream about going to heaven. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we begin to create a cause, teach people of the divine enablements, uh, go out and uh, create wealth, because you cannot be a kingdom without wealth. Uh, once you have wealth, amen, then you can have a bit of authority. Let me say the golden rule, you know, as the gold rule. Well, if you're going to take a stand, you got to have wealth. And uh, and we have not trained our people that. We have, we taught them how to pray and all that, but God empowered us to create. He, he says, um, uh, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. He says, listen, as you enlighten your soul, as you come into the truth, he said, prosperity is yours, but you got to change some things. Uh, as bad as America is, it's, it's, it's the best place in the world for opportunity. That's why everybody comes here. But we just got to learn our rights. We got to take our stand. You know, uh, uh, our, our educational system is geared to make somebody else wealthy. You know, they will never tell you how to use... Uh, to create wealth. You know, we live in a capitalistic society, but no one goes to school and learn how to capitalize in this society. We go and they tell us to prepare to be selected by somebody else so mm. they can make wealth off us. And we go and we spend a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars and hope somebody select us. And then if they don't select us, we spend a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars educating. But we don't know how to create wealth, so we go take a job for twenty dollars an hour. Why? Because the church has not been able to teach people their enablements and how to prosper with them. And so, if there's going to be a change, you know, I mean, you got to know the system is corrupt. The whole educational system is corrupt because it never teach you how to produce. It teach you how to participate in what someone else is producing, and uh, that it's. You know, we got to right the wrong. We have to come together as a cause and see that we're enabled. And I was listening to Apostle, and uh, he was talking about the book that's out of print. Uh, but you still can get the Willie Lynch story. You know what I'm saying? How have you read the Willie Lynch story? But it is a strategy. It's a plan. It is put into place. And uh, it has turned us on us. You know what I'm saying? And belittle us and then put fear within us. And it's perpetrated all the way. And so that stuff you were seeing going on, and even in, when uh, uh, Floyd was being, what did he do? He cried to his mother, you know what I'm saying? Because she cried to indoctrinate, be careful with these people, be careful with these people. She put the thing in there. He tried to do his thing, but it's ties and stuff. And so we have to understand that is a reason why folks don't want us to rise, you know what I'm saying? Because in anything we get into, because of what God is justifying the grace, when we come into wisdom, then we were able, because of our oppression, to strive higher. I, I said the other day, I was teaching, I said, there's three things that we should be in pursuit of. And the scripture teaches that, and that is knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And that's very little pursuit in the church today. You have to have knowledge of things. I mean, you need information. You know, you don't know about it, then you can never maximize it. Then you need to understand. It has talking about uh, comprehension. I need to understand how this system works. 
All we know is how to go to work. We understand the system and then wisdom. Wisdom is the right application of the knowledge and understanding we have. And uh, if we could pull, if we could do that, that, you know, you know, <laughs> I, I remember saying, I think the scripture says, no one uh, listens to a poor man's wisdom. There was a man who could save the city, but because he had no economics, then no one listened to his wisdom. And that's where we are, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we can't rebel, we can't fight because we don't have the resources or we don't have the oneness. They will give you more time for killing a dog than they would for you killing a black man because yeah. of the cause of the, you know, righteous, you know, animal rights and all that kind of stuff. And so this is where we are. Make sense? Amen. Absolutely. That. <laughs> well, if the church told that, then we better wait till we get to heaven. You know what I'm saying? That's what a lot of folks doing. And let me say, let me say, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably going too far. No, go ahead. I already went too far, so it's on you. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't change in the church, then we're wasting God's opportunity. You from? It's, 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 there are more people. There are people in church who still as rebellious against God as Adam and Eve were in the day. They don't want to surrender to His Lord. Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life." But when you live independent or you want to make your own calls, then you exclude yourself from the life that God come given us to resurrect us and restore our dominion. Amen. And, and so uh, once we understand that, repent and yield, die to self and take this life of Christ, then we'll be the head and not the tail above and never to me. And uh, you can't you can't compare God's wisdom. And uh, but you, you got to understand you have an enemy inside of you. And so what the church has tried to do is to try to be impressive by gathering a lot of numbers and, you know, a bunch of people or think because you have a big crowd that you're doing a great work. But you really are not because the kingdom of heaven is not being manifested on earth through you. And that's our assignment. That's the exchange. God died in our place that we could live in his. Uh, and, and so. The church has lost that, you know. Uh, I said that the church is like an organization. Uh, you know, you call people, you're supposed to be for the people. And then once you get the people, then the people is for the organization. That should never be, you know what I'm saying? If I'm preaching a message and it's not designed to make you a better person, then I've forsaken my call. Mm. See what I'm saying? I'm not to impress you to, and build numbers. I need to change your life. And if I don't, and the only way I can do that is to change the way you think and get you to agree with the higher way of Christ. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm just really hustling you. And so, uh, wow. So you, you know, you, you have to figure out. You know, I got to give an account to God. You know, and people are strange. You know, they're they're very strange. You know, uh, <laughs> if you're not strong, they will castrate you. <laughs> mm. Wow. And then you won't be a man. Everybody else control you. So it's it's like a wife. She's got to she's got to buck you to see if you're strong enough that she can trust you to protect her. Mm. And if you can't do that, my dad just said, if you can't sleep by yourself, then don't get married because she's gonna be punk. <laughs> 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 it's just the real life, you know. I look at a lot of guys. I say, oh my God, they're constipated. I mean, I mean, they got no no manhood, you know. They, Nothing, you know what I'm saying? And uh, they become, because no one's showing you who you are and what grace has been placed in your conversion. And, I, I, you know, I guess I'm preaching, but it's just it's, it's, it's the thing in my heart when I see people go through the motion and, and you see them 10 years later and none the better in character or in person or in their material prosperity or even in their understanding. You know, um, yeah, you know. Um, so you asked me about the church. I guess I got there. I don't know. I, I, I made oh, a hard awesome. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's an amazing thing to me that we, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bishop. <laughs> as a church, as a leader, we are so small minded, we cannot recognize the grace or the measure of grace that God has set before us to bring us to another level. We are in competition, if though I got to prove myself. No, no, we have to, you know, we have to understand that for every grace, every gift, 
there are measures of gifts and we have to recognize the person who has the grace or the measure that can sustain me or help me get to the next measure without being envious. And, uh, and, 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 and the sad thing is that most, uh, well, I can't say that uh, when I said that way, I might get uh, run out of town. <laughs> <laughs> most of the preachers of our day just took it on for a career mm -hmm. and they have low self-esteem. And so they'll pay any price to make themselves feel good or make have others make them feel good. It's a difficult. And if you're not strong enough to be able to walk in who you are, then how can God use you if you're controlled by everybody else? And mm -hmm. so, you know, we're selling everything, you know, you know, people lining up to get this or this title, that title, and they still won't submit, you know. You, you know, you know what, who is the chief apostle of the city? You know. I want to know. I want to know because this is our city. If we don't have a head, then we're a freak. I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Somebody needs to say this is the this is the apostle of the city, so that person can set government, and that God can speak. Where is the prophet? That what is the voice of God saying in this hour of opportunity that we all would surrender to know that's the voice of God? and then pull on our grace gift. And so until the church becomes the body, we're just something on the sideline. And the enemy does a great job dividing us because we get our manhood by how many people we can gather. Mm. And, uh, so. Wow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I haven't forgotten about you, Apostle Bracey. Uh, I'm going to let Apostle Coleman have some last words just in case he needs to leave out because i know he has another program so apostle coleman just go ahead and and give us some last remarks here uh whatever you feel the the lord is is uh is uh saying any advice that you would have um what apostle well i'm i'm, I'm grateful to be on the program with uh with the persons that are here and uh, to your audience as well and i i hope that uh collectively we have been uh, a blessing by way of insight and, and wisdom we certainly uh, do not have all of the uh, answers, nor would time per permit us the opportunity to uh, to provide all the answers that we even know to put out there. Uh, so we're we're grateful just to have this opportunity to be able to to talk on a relevant uh, subject that is, is is right before our eyes right now. Nobody thought that when we entered into this pandemic, that we, we entered into this economic uh, collapse. Nobody thought that we would also have a an emergence of civil unrest that the that the, uh, if you will, the original sin of this country would become uh, at the forefront in the midst of a, a, a number of other crises that's already going on. You, you couldn't, uh, uh, you, you know, you, if you were trying to draw this up yourself, you couldn't draw it up. And so I have to believe that God's hand is in this uh, and that God's timing is associated with, uh, with all of what is happening right now. And what we have to do is we have to be uh, we have to be discerners of the way we have to have discernment into what uh, what God is uh, what God is saying uh, in this hour. And I believe that uh, uh, one of the things that Bishop Jones said is the importance of us recognizing that we have to remain on task. Uh, that our job is not just to push our way or push others into heaven, but to establish the king's uh, 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 priorities right here on earth to establish uh, what his agenda is right here on earth. And we are alive at such a time as this uh, for purposes of advancing the kingdom's uh, agenda right now. This is our day and this is our hour. Uh, we are alive in this moment uh, for the purposes of advancing the kingdom of God. And uh -huh. it shows that the bandwidth through which we do that is much broader than we thought. We thought that we could do that in our silos and our church assemblies and what have you. And God sent us all home. <laughs> you know, we're, 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 we're migrating back in, but God sent all of us home uh, in, in one way or the other uh, to let us know that it's bigger than your four walls. And I think we kind of knew that intuitively, but he put that in our face that, that this is bigger than those four walls. And if you don't manage outside of those four walls, then you're going to collapse within your walls. So we have to broaden uh, our perspective, not just uh, uh, physically in terms of physical structures, but we have to make sure that our mindsets and our mentalities and our thinking and teaching 
that we are that, that we are uh, advocating a gospel to the world. Jesus said something. He said, "This gospel will be preached to all the world. Then the end will come." And uh, an important aspect of that is to understand that unless the gospel is palatable to the the entire world, then whatever is being promulgated is not really the gospel. So uh, we, we, it must be a gospel that has impact in every realm, in every uh, in, in in every dimension of our living. Uh, the gospel is a key aspect uh, critical to the liberation of an oppressed people <laughs> it's it's critical to uh, it's critical to uh, uh, to bringing judgment where people are unwilling to change because that's a, it, it's, it's the proclamation that is made in the earth that will stay the hand of judgment or will bring the hand of judgment this is why as it was pointed out Jonah had such a problem with Nineveh because he knew the heart of God he knew that uh, God's hand of judgment would be stayed against Nineveh if Nineveh had sense enough and the passion to repent and that Jonah was sent there to say repent and God will stay the hand of judgment. Ultimately, judgment fell on them anyway, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it, they were spared for a season because they turned at the, at the preaching of Jonah. And so we have the, we have the knob of God's judgment or God's favor in our hands. That's a critical role of the preachers and prophets of God. Is we have the we have we have the lever of judgment or grace and blessing. And if we operate, if we manage our levers properly, then what will happen is uh, mm -hmm. things will begin to change because God is working with us. God is is moving on our behalf. But we got to come up. We got to come up to the plate. We got to we got to step up. Whatever He's going to do on the earth. He's going to do it with somebody that is cooperating with him, somebody that is in alignment with him, somebody that's willing to, to go for it, somebody that's willing to, to do it. There's got to be some Johns out there. There's got to be some Elijah spirit forerunners, those that are the preparers of the way. There's got to be those that are, are willing to stand on the front line. And I believe that this season is provoking uh, those that will, will make up a hedge, that will intercede. Uh, that will plead the cause and that will have an impact because they know how things work. Uh, the tribe of Issachar, uh, they knew what Israel ought to do. And because of that, they had special preference because they knew what Israel ought to do. We got to have the discernment to know how to produce that, uh, to reduce the realities of the kingdom of God in our present day operation, just like Daniel and them were able to impact Babylon. We got to impact Babylon. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right. Apostle Gracie. I'm I'm no, go ahead, Apostle. So if, uh, if I look like I disappeared, it's only because I have. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much for, for joining us, Apostle. We, we truly appreciate all of the Bless words you. of wisdom and thank God for you, sir. Bless you. Thank you. Bless you, man. Bless you, man. Bless you. Amen. All right, so Apostle um, Bracy, just go ahead and just have some words. Let the mm -hmm. Lord use you, and we'll we'll close out. Uh, Bishop Jones, uh, let let him have some final remarks, and then uh, Apostle, I'll have you to pray us out. Okay, you know it's in, it's interesting. Um, I, I I started with scripture indicating that our cause is a just cause. You know, mm -hmm. God God hates racism, so we're on the right side of this when we stand when we stand. In opposition to racism, we're on we're on the right side. You know, three things I'll mention: we need balance, we need truth, and we need kingdom. Those three. We need a balance. Um, we need a balance between the spiritual and the natural. A solid balance. We recognize that racism is indeed a spirit. Mm. It has manifestations in the earth realm. So we need to attack it simultaneously, both in the realm of the spirit as well as in the realm of the natural. I've said that before, and Apostle Coleman really laid a lot of foundation there. But we have to have balance. For far too long, we have uh, uh, been in church and doing church mm. with nothing. Like I said, when we, when, we were, when we were coming up, nothing was said about really, not much was said about, I should say, about politics and about economics, about social things, about uh, education. Those, I think, the whole thing, I want to get you saved, sanctified through the Holy Ghost. That was mighty burning fire. And I want you to go out, like Bishop Jones said, I want you to go out and get some other people and bring them into this building that they can go out and do the same thing. But there was not a balance of the fact that we have to live in a real 
in a real world with real situations, real circumstances, and the fact that racism is real. You know, um, I, I, I use this example all the time because I think it's appropriate when I talk about the, the justness and the righteousness of our cause. You know, again, I'm that movie fan. I'm that Rambo guy. And Rambo, and Rambo, Rambo one, uh, Rambo was assaulted by the police. He was beat by the police. He ended up running hiding in the cave. Uh, and his commanding officer came to try to talk him out of the cave. Mm. And Rambo's response was, "Hey, they drew first blood. <laughs> the reality is, they drew first blood. Now they want to tell us how to respond to our bleeding. It makes no sense. You can't stab me and then tell me how to respond. To you are stabbing me. So we have to recognize." That that all there's a system that want to set that wants to set parameters on our protest, and, mm -hmm. and you cannot set parameters on my protest by nature. A protest of me saying I don't like what you're doing, and I need you to see that I don't like what you're doing. But because the system is so ingrained, it means that protest has to continue. And I'm not saying necessarily just talking about protest standing in the street. I'm saying this is that every one of us has a grace. There's an anointing on all of our lives. And what we need to do as individuals and then collectively the body of Christ, we need to go to God. God, where do you want me to be? What grace do you want to release in my life at this time, in this season? We've been this thing for 400 years. God, you remember our other children, right? Israel, you brought them out after 400 years. God, I believe it's our time. So give us the strategies. Give us the wisdom, the insight. Give us the things that we need to do to come out of this situation. So we need balance and then we need, we need truth. And we really need truth. Because the truth will set you free. It's interesting uh, talking about racism in the church. Just briefly, I was watching this program not too long ago, uh, and a well-known program, international program, and the guy brought a prophet on. Uh, he said it was a prophet anyway. He brought this guy, prophet. He said, "Prophet, tell us what God is saying." And this guy said, "What God is saying?" He said, "This is what God is saying." He said, "God took me in a vision, and He took me to China, and He took me to the laboratory." where the Chinese were gen uh, genetically engineering this virus. And Nancy Pelosi was there. Mm. Woman was there. And I'm saying, huh. And then we're on the prophesy. And, and the thing that got me is that the host of the show is all in truth. Oh, my goodness. This is the word of God. Mm. People in the audience are all, oh, my God, we got a word from the Lord. The, you know, the Chinese invented this thing. They genetically engineered it in Pelosi and, and, and Schumer was there. And then he went on to prophesy. But you know what? It's just like a virus. It's going to be dead in April. And I said to myself, did God say that or did Donald Trump say that? <laughs> so we need, we, need, we need to know the truth and we need to be able to preach the truth and then confront falsehood when it comes, this guy is prophesying out of his own imagination. He's prophesying out of, out of a political thought. He's prophesying really with a racist overtone. Wow. And we have to be able to confront that kind of stuff. And it's interesting because I saw that clip, a friend of mine sent it to me. I said, did you watch this? Don't be forwarding stuff that you don't under, that, 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 that's, that's falsehood. You know, social media is an amazing thing. But I've been getting posts and tweets and I'm telling people, listen, don't tweet me no more. This, this is so, is so inaccurate. This, this is this. You're talking about fake news. This is this is this is made up stuff. Yeah. So, so we ha we have to have the because we need to have balance, truth, and then we need to understand kingdom. See, for far too long we've been religious. Mm. You ask people, we well, ask them about church. What the, first you ask them about church? What they start talking about? Stained glass windows. They start talking about the choir, the choir director, and all those other things. But when you start talking about kingdom, you talk about systems. You talk mm. about political systems, economic systems, social systems, educational systems. So when we begin to talk about kingdom, then we recognize that it's more than just going to church. It's a life that has to be lived. And there are things that are going on that are unjust. And we have a responsibility to confront those things that are unjust. Do we love God? Absolutely. Do we love people? Absolutely. But we cannot be lulled to sleep by thinking that racism is not real in America. And we have a responsibility to hate it because God hates it. And then we need to do something about it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Bishop, go ahead and have some last remarks. And then uh, Apostle Bracey, we'll have you to, to pray us out. Thank you, Lord. I think I think Apostle said it all. It's a thing. I do want to say that the prophetic or the word of prophecy has to be judged. Oh, yeah. 
it has to be judged according to the spirit of Christ and the letter of the word. And anything that doesn't align with Christ's spirit, you know, it, you, you just have to be careful about that. But when we know him ourselves, mm -hmm. the prophetic word is a confirmation, if I'm saying, because it's supposed to be the voice of God. Do you know your father's voice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're supposed to know your father's voice. If you don't know his voice, then you may not be with him. So, mm -hmm. you know, I hear a lot of stuff and I'm saying, that don't sound like my father. You know what I'm saying? You know, I know his voice. And that's not in his spirit, you kind of what I'm saying. And so these are the kind of things. And so I, I perceive that God is going to be glorified in all of this uh, yeah. because the church is really getting a chance to see itself this role. And if we can repent, if we could repent and come together and because we're stronger together than we are divided, then we can make a change. I think it's a grand opportunity. Uh, and we're, we're sorry for the lives of lost, but... I've never felt like there was possibilities as they are today. Mm -hmm. And we, if we act upon them and don't allow uh, the naysayers and those activists to come in and turn it around and make it, I really believe people see what the wrong is and want to make a change. And uh, we can't make this change by ourselves. And right now is a grand opportunity. We just got to be wiser than we are. I thank you for allowing me to share with you today. I hope something was said that uh, was beneficial. And uh, uh, we all need, can I say this, that Christianity is not a religion. It is a way of life based on a personal relationship with God. And there are a lot of people who go to church, but they don't have a personal relationship with God through the auspices of the Holy Spirit. And that what gives us our distinction. And uh, God will see us through this, but it's based on our relationship. And with any relationship, the determining factor is communication. And so when I listen to people, I want to hear God. In them. If I can't hear God, then I really don't feel like I've been aided because our voice should be a reflection of his voice. And, uh, and so that's what we're looking for. I believe we're going to come out on time. Thank you again, uh, Pastor Bracey. It was just a pleasure to be able to share with you. This is an amazing thing. We learned how to live together, uh, you, know, uh, you know, viral, amen. We, we don't have time to come in, but we thank God for it. Uh, uh, Vail, you know I love you. You know, we family. And uh, thank you so much. I, only you would have got me on the show. But anyway, I'm here. <laughs> amen. Thank you both so much. And thank you to Apostle Coleman. I, I, I am truly, truly I'm honored that you all took time. You all are very busy men of God who are, I'm talking about in the midst of the pandemic. You know, a lot of people, I, I told uh, somebody the first two weeks, uh, as you all know, my wife actually had the coronavirus um, back in back in March and we were quarantined for, for two weeks. And for those first two weeks, all I did was watch Netflix. I, I, I slept in, got up, watched Netflix. And then I was listening to uh, my buddy Jay Will's podcast and he said, wouldn't it be a shame that after all of this is over, you come out and all you're able to do is say you caught up on some TV shows? And I was convicted. And I said, you know what? I don't want to come out with that testimony. So I started this show. I started write, writing my, uh, my, my third play. Um, I started uh, getting the, the, the house in order for the baby. I started working and doing things. And I know that you all have not stopped. You all have not let this pandemic stop you all. You all have been pressing forward. So thank you so much for all of your time. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom. I've been getting comments after comments. If you all go back and look on the Facebook page of people just thanking you all for the wisdom that God has given you all. So thank you all so much for tuning for, for joining me today to talk about this, this very important subject. And we're going to let Apostle Bracey uh, pray us out. Okay, one 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 quick thing, Bishop. Yes, Bishop, <laughs> he he just mentioned, you know, we need to know the voice of the Lord. Uh, Jesus said to a group of people, "You are of your Father." Yes, sir. Come on. And your works, his works, you will do. We need to recognize what's God and what's not God. Yeah. A lot of what's being talked out as God today really is not Him. So we need to pray for a spirit of discernment. Absolutely, absolutely. God. And then, and then once, once, listen, once we know it's God, we won't turn back. We got to make sure that it is God. Father, in Jesus' name, first of all, we give you glory, honor, and praise. 
Yes. Father, we thank you for this time uh, of sharing, and we pray, God, that we've said something that has added value to those that have tuned in to hear us tonight. We pray, God, that you would continue to give us wisdom and understanding and insight, God. Give us knowledge and revelation, God, that we might accurately proceed in this season that we're in. We thank you, Father, because we know that you are with us because you are against injustice and you are against racism. So, Father, just give us wisdom, understanding, and insight that we'll move strategically in this season that we will always serve to bring you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me put your informations up here. So Apostle uh, Donald Coleman is senior pastor at New Breakthrough Church International, and you can visit their website at newbreakthroughchurch.com to get information on uh, when they're having their virtual services. Um, Apostle Bracey is the overseer of Shiloh Deliverance Church International, and that is actually the name, Shiloh Deliverance Church International on Facebook. And uh, his son, Pastor Chioki Bracey, has been doing a phenomenal job of um, preaching um, virtually every Sunday. So make sure you tune in. And, and every now and then, you're going to see Apostle Bracey jump on and, and, and say what the Lord is saying uh, unto him. And of course, Bishop Jones is the senior pastor of Found the Truth. And you can visit their website, seethefountain.com. They are on um, every Sunday morning at, at uh, 10 a.m., on uh on youtube live every every sunday morning at 10 a.m so i awesome. truly appreciate you all thank god for you uh joining me today amen and listen everybody i want to make sure that you all tune in next week i'm going to be talking to a young lady by the name of taylor harrell who's running for state representative and my sister Amen. My, my good friend, Rebecca Coleman, who is Judge Coleman's daughter, she is going to be, uh, she actually is running for judge. She's already an attorney. She's going to be running for judge. So we're going to talk to them and have them to talk to young people about voting. You heard a lot about voting, putting things in place. So we're going to talk to them next week on Quarantine with Lavelle at 630. Again, thank you to my very special guests, Apostle Bobby Bracey, Bishop Michael Jones Sr., and Apostle Donald Coleman Sr. Thank God. Please share this. Start a watch party. This word needs to go out. I'm going to go back and I'm going to watch it and I'm going to get this wisdom that they have given us today. So truly thank God for each and every one of you tuning in. Thank you. And we'll see you next Thursday at 630.